Have you ever thought about the subtitle of a book? In writing a book, authors are often required to come up with a, a subtitle. The title is catchy, and the subtitle succinctly explains what the book aims to do. What would your subtitle to Genesis be? It could be a story of God's faithfulness, certainly. Or we could call it sordid sins and the stories of treachery. I mean, that, that's what we've seen. And I've been convicted of both of these. M mostly when I've tried to figure out why God would choose to be faithful when he knew the wickedness of people would define who they are. As you listen to this passage, Genesis 38 being read, it will come to you as no surprise that this passage, this sermon, is no different than the sermons that we've heard already. I don't know about you, but I, I, I am a bit frustrated with all of these stories about people who I would want to have no association with. And I wonder, what does God want us to see in this? Well, I think our church is a little different than many places in that, that we deal with difficult things like these passages as they present themselves. We don't skip over or ignore parts of the Bible simply because they're uncomfortable to us. We preach God's entire word because it is infinitely valuable. We preach these kind of passages with fear and trembling, certainly, because they're valuable to you and to me. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, for one thing, were you taught this as a child? Were you taught these stories in Genesis as a child? If you're like me, chances are you were not. You were taught about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're heroes of the faith, and they accomplished wonderful things for the Lord. And then as an adult, you read this and you say, whoo, these guys were not as nice as I thought they were. These guys had bad stories just like I do. These guys are not heroes. These guys are, are, are normal people with abnormal lives, certainly. Do we know the misdeeds done by Abraham where we taught that his offspring did so much harm to so many people? These passages are a good reminder that there are no superheroes or super saints apart from Christ. And in a way, these passages are like looking at a mirror. I just said that I wouldn't want to associate with these characters, but I'm just as bad as they are. Not indeed, maybe. Maybe I'm not as bad as they are in my actions, but here and here, absolutely I am. The thoughts that I've had and the, the desires of my heart are, make me just as guilty as these characters. You have to. The heart is deceitfully wicked. So much of Genesis is recorded so that we can see one thing, and it's really the entire theme of the Bible. It is our need for salvation, because these people certainly can't do it for us. They couldn't save themselves. So let's look at this passage in a little more depth while remembering that Jesus is the solution to these problems, these family problems, these, these sordid tales that we've read about. Jesus is the solution. And we see these problems beginning again in verses 1 through 11. This is Judah's dysfunction. Verse 1 says that Judah departed from his brothers. Now his brothers, not the best guys, they had just sold their brother into slavery. They, they had thought to kill him. And then they decided, well, no, let's, let's not kill him. Let's make some profit off of him and let's send him down to Egypt and we'll never have to see him again. And then they lied to their father, saying that their brother had been devoured by an animal. So not, not good guys, certainly, not, not nice guys, but leaving them, Judah left them, and by leaving them, he was leaving the place that God told him to dwell. Judah leaves his brothers and goes into Canaanite territory, a place that he should never have gone. In fact, no one should have ever gone into Canaanite territory. I don't want to 
over-apply this passage to our lives because it's very easy to do that because we read stories about these people and say, well, how can I apply their lives to mine? I don't want to do that because that's not the main point, but however, I think there is something to learn here. Judah left his family. Judah left those who loved him and cared for him. Judah left the one part of his life that was sort of stable. Many of us have have done this too. We've left our home or our family behind to a new place to attend college, to get a new job, to find a new future for ourselves. My parents and my brother and my family, my immediate family, all live in the same town that I grew up in. They've, they've never left and will never leave. Right now, I'm the closest to my parents geographically than I've been in 13 years. For 10 years before, before coming here, the closest I lived was 800 miles away. See, many of us will move away. Many of us will leave places, and it's never easy. See, we leave behind a support system a structure, something to give us stability. And Judah left this behind. Leaving his family wasn't such a bad thing, aside from disobeying God. But no one in his family has has seemed to learn the art of making good decisions. But by leaving, Judah opened himself to even more problems than he would have had at home. Maybe you as a parent, your kid wants to move to New York City or Los Angeles, and, and maybe they have struggles here at home in, in East Tennessee, and you know as a parent, you going there is not going to end well for you. And you can almost see that, that, that Judah's brothers and his, his parents are clinging, saying, do not go to Canaan. Do not go to those people. And by leaving, he opened himself up to problems, and really what we see, and this is kind of a story throughout Genesis is that Judah's issue, this thing that he struggled with, and he'll see it over and over, was sexual sin. Verse 2 says that Judah was tempted by a woman, and he married her. You say, well, hey, aren't we encouraging marriage? Isn't, isn't a marriage between a man and a woman something to be celebrated? Well, yes. When it honors the Lord, Judah went to Canaan to find a woman. And we'll see this fleshed out in more detail through the next few books, but God's people were not to marry outside of the covenant. Again, I don't want to overapply this, but there's another lesson for us. God's standards for marriage are given to us for a reason. I've seen it too many times where a Christian will fall in love with someone who's not a believer. And some of those marriages work. They're not often what I would call healthy, but sometimes they work. But more often than not, the Christian will become less and less enthusiastic about their faith. See, when we follow what God says, it's another layer of protection for us. God's standards for marriage and relationships are given to us for a few reasons. They're given to us because God demands that we honor him in everything that we do. Sin in the life of a Christian is not good for us. Also, God's standards are given to protect us. This isn't anything profound. When two people get married they have, and they have different religious beliefs or different worldviews, something has to give. But when two people who are of the same mind, of the same background, who are going in the same direction get married, those issues just aren't present. You agree on how to parent, how to worship, what to value? See, Judah's disregard for God's standard got him into trouble, and it's what this entire chapter discusses. We can trace back every issue that we've seen through people in Genesis, and we can say, you made a bad choice, you made a bad choice, you made a bad choice, and all of those bad choices brought you here. One bad choice after another leads to disaster for these people. I want you to see what's been apparent throughout the entire book of Genesis. When God tells you to do something, it's best that you obey. 
We may prosper for a time, but the damage done will last far beyond the immediate moment. Seminary President Ligon Duncan said this in his sermon on this passage, quote, I think Moses is making a comment here on the danger of becoming yoked with the world. Judah has been sucked into the Canaanite culture, the Canaanite value system, the practices of the Canaanites, and he's been sucked in precisely because of the fact that he's married into it. This is Judah's own choice. And I want to say that it's a tremendous warning to us. Anytime the Christian lives in a culture where we are accepted and where we are relatively at peace, we are in danger of being sucked into its prevailing system of values, especially when we intermarry with it. So Judah gets sucked into the system, this this Canaanite, this wicked, this, this, this heathen system. They're outside of the covenant. They they do not belong to God. They do not worship the one true God. They are enemies of God. And Judah is drawn into this. Just as much as many of us at some point in our lives were drawn into things that we knew we shouldn't be doing. Maybe it's a relationship. Most of us, it's a relationship that we've had at some point where the the feelings, the emotions, the the the. The lust pulled us into that direction to the point where we realized shouldn't be here, but man, I like it. And so Judah goes and he sees this woman and and he's drawn to her and he takes her as his wife and they have three sons together, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. All three of these men will play prominent roles in Scripture all with arranged marriages at the center. Now these arranged marriages don't happen today, at least not in Western culture, but in the ancient culture this was practiced. So Judah found a wife, Tamar, for his oldest son, Ur. Verse 7 says, But but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Moses has chosen not to include why He was evil. No details given, but we can assume maybe that it was idolatry. That was a common practice of the day. The wording leads us maybe into that direction. But either way, whatever Ur did was enough for God to strike him down. You say, I'm struggling with that. Because the God that I worship, the, the, we sing the songs, you're a good, good father, right? We, we, we think God, or we know that God is good. He, he's merciful, he's kind, he's just, he's love. And yet here, we see God killing someone. What do we do? This is one of the problems that people have with this passage and, and, and many others that are found in the Bible. And I don't mean to be trite, but if our idea of God is an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud playing a harp telling us constantly how great we are, of course this will bother us. We will be bothered when we see that God struck down Ur. He killed him. Now, there are other passages that deal with this. God striking down the entire Canaanites. But the question remains, if God is good, how can he kill someone? Some would say, well, God's a murderer then. Well, murder requires something, a taking a life outside of the law. So God cannot murder since God cannot be outside of his law. Uh, some would define murder more about the victim, someone who is innocent. And this is the argument that so many people make against the Christian faith is they say, how could God tell his people to go kill innocents, especially women and children? And this assumes, though, that there are innocent people. Whenever you can show me one innocent person from God's perspective, not from ours, but from God's perspective, then we'll have a conversation about this. But since God created everything, he has the sovereign right to do whatever he wants with his creation. I'll give you an example. I have two sons, and for many years they played Legos. They would build these, these intricate buildings and they would, they would keep building on and on to this. And, and, and at some point, as we all know, because parents need to walk barefoot on top of Lego pieces, the kids will tear those Legos down. They'll tear the creation apart, right? 
You built it, you tear it down. It's yours. But when the brother comes in and tears it down, well, we've got a problem then. Why? He didn't build it. He built it. He wrecked it. He's the only one who has the the ability or the authority to wreck his creation. And we see this with God. God created everything. He has the right to do whatever he wants. And we know this from our own self. When God chooses that our time is up, our time is up. Whether we die of natural causes or we die in a car accident or we die from some other means, when our time is up, our time is up. God, if we believe that God is sovereign, if we believe that God has authority over his creation, we know that God has the authority over our birth and our death and everything in between. So Ur dies. He's wicked. God kills him. And then something very strange happens. Look at verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, have relations with your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up a child for your brother. This is not something that we do very often. I I joke, I've got family in West Virginia, and this is normal for them, but we don't look kindly on this, do we? This would be weird. There's nothing immoral or unethical necessarily about it. It's just not a normal practice today. But it was then, and you may have not heard this term, but it's Leverite marriage. It literally means marriage with the brother-in-law. It comes from the Latin word meaning a husband's brother. In the ancient world, if a man died and he was married and he did not father a son yet, the next brother in line who was unmarried would step in and fulfill those duties. And they would marry his wife, provide a, an heir to provide a son But here's the kicker. That son that shares that man's DNA doesn't belong to him. He belongs to the deceased brother. What it means is that the firstborn gets first crack. He dies. The next son comes up, but the son still belongs to the firstborn. I know it's a little confusing. It's more fleshed out in Deuteronomy 25 if you want to study this. So in this story, Onan is the second son of Judah. So Judah had three sons. Ur dies. Onan now steps in, and he becomes the husband to Tamar, getting ready to father a son with Tamar. But the son would belong to Ur. Strange, I know. Verse 9 says that Onan knew that the child would not be his. So when he had relations with his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground so that he would not give a child to his brother. Onan sinned here? It wasn't even so much the act, but rather he was disobedient to his father's commands and because he was selfish. He had a responsibility. He had a duty. He had a job to do, providing an heir, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to raise his brother's son. He didn't want to have to split his portion of the family Wealth with another child. Onan sinned because he was selfish. And then God kills Onan for his disobedience. Verse 10, but what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. Same story. So now Tamar is twice widowed. Then Judah made a promise, something that he had no intention of fulfilling. Look at verse 11. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brother. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Judah said, my third son, the last one that I've had, when he comes of age, he will fulfill the role and father a child in her's place. Judah clearly thought that Tamar was at fault for the death of his two sons. Didn't even consider the fact that maybe they were just bad. Maybe they were wicked. It is kind of funny. There is no honor in in thieves, right? That that when someone is, is, is wicked or sinful, it's very, very difficult for them to see the sins or the wickedness in someone else because they're kind of all banded together. 
Tamar seems to initially believe Judah because she goes along with the plan. Judah removed her from the picture. His way out of the mess because Sheila was then going to be legally responsible for providing a son to Tamar was to send Tamar away. Go to your father's house in a few years, come back. You and my last son can get married. You guys can have children or a child and all will be well. You know, the theme throughout Genesis has been God's faithfulness when we're not, but there's something else that I've seen over and over, and it's very disturbing. Is that these people that we're reading about seem to have absolutely no care for others. They don't respect one another. They're selfish. Onan's certainly not the the first selfish person in here. They don't have any respect for the dignity and value of other human beings. You see some slimy behavior. Not only did Judah trick Tamar bad enough, but he put her in a situation where she had no protection. He had absolutely no intention of providing his last son to her, and now she is twice widowed, no child, There's only one story for her at this point now in Judah's mind is to let her live the rest of her life and die as she is. So Tamar does what most people do. She hatches a plan to get what's rightfully hers. Put aside a Christian perspective for a moment. This would make an incredible movie. This is like Revenge 101, right? This is like we're cheering for Tamar to give Judah his comeuppance, right? We, we want to see that. We want to see Judah uh, go down in flames. Now, unpause your Christian perspective and see that what's happening is still not good. Verse 12 says that a considerable time has passed. However long that was, it was long enough for Tamar to realize that Judah was not going to fulfill his promise. It could have been a few years, long enough to, to see Sheila grow up and He's maybe now a man, and it's time to say, hey, where, where is he in my life? And he's not coming, so i got to figure this out. And here's the plan. She would entice and trap Judah and force him to father the son that was promised to her. Look at verses 13 through 16. And Tamar was told, behold, your father-in-law is coming up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had, and she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he assumed that she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. She, so she, he turned aside to buy, uh, to buy the road and said, here now, let me have relations with you for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that you may have relations with me? There's a few cultural things to unpack here. First, after a time of mourning, it would be normal, not good, but normal for men to seek the comfort of women. It was also sheep sheep shearing time, and Judah would be visiting his friend Hira. Leaving the safety of home, going to a place where no one really knows who you are, opening the door for you to do bad things. And Tamar knew that. At at this time, prostitutes would sell their services as some kind of fertility magic to help the crops grow and the, the herds to expand. So Tamar's plan was to disguise herself as a prostitute in the hopes that she could sleep with Judah and produce an heir. And that's what Tamar does. Judah takes the bait, verse 17 Judah says, I will send a young goat, send you a young goat from the flock. And she says, will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord and your staff that's in your hand. So he gave them to her, had relations with her, and she conceived by him. Judah doesn't give her the goat immediately because he doesn't have one. So he says, I'll give you the goat. And she says, well, wait, I need proof that you're going to give it to me. Give me something that means something to you to prove that you're going to come back and give me what I ask. So she says, give me the seal and the cord and the staff that you're holding. Okay, none of us carry staffs around. That's what wizards do. That's weird. 
Most of us don't have seals or insignias or something that we use when we write letters. That's pretty cool, but most of us don't do that. But back then, this was like a passport. That's probably the best way. It's a driver's license. It's a credit card. It's something for, for, for her to hold, uh, uh, to prove, to say, if you don't come back, I get to keep all of these things. And I want you to notice something else, too. Uh, again, not reading into this too much, but do you notice how goats play a big role in this? Like, at every turn, there's a goat, and at every turn, something bad is happening because of what these people are doing, and the goat somehow finds its way in? Well, anyway, after everything had finished, Judah leaves, and something happens that he didn't want to see her again. Maybe it's the guilt that he has, the, the, the guilt that his conscience is, is, is aflame from, from what he had just done. Whatever his cause, he sends his friend to take the goat to Tamar. The friend arrives and says, I'm looking for the, the temple prostitute. Where is she? And they said, well, there's no one like her here. When Judah heard this, he says, we got to keep this to ourselves. Maybe he was ashamed at what people in the community would think about him, that, that, that he had relations with a prostitute. Uh, or maybe he, he was ashamed that he was outsmarted by a prostitute. Well, a few months later, everyone knows that Tamar is pregnant, but she had no husband. And so you can imagine the gossip mill is churning at this point. Wait, she's not married. She's got this bump. She's past the point where where it's okay to, to ask her. We have all asked her. We know what she is. But she's not married. Did you see? Did you see Tamar? Oh, yeah. Saw her. See, many of you know what it's like to grow up and know people who were teenage or unmarried women who were pregnant. And, and you know what people do when they see that. They start talking. Hurtful gossip. And, and you can imagine that Tamar is, is feeling the weight of this right now, that, that, that she's carrying this baby. She, she knows what she's done, but she's carrying this baby, and everyone around her is talking about her. She feels like an outcast. And what's interesting to see is that when Judah finds out that Tamar is pregnant, what does Judah do? He gets angry. Self-righteous hypocrisy. What does he say? He doesn't just say banish her. He doesn't just say ignore her. He doesn't just say, uh, you know, put a, a scarlet letter on her and, and move her along. No, he said bring her out and let's burn her. Like zero to 100 real quick. Why? Because he understands guilt. He knows what he's done. He doesn't know who, who this woman is. He doesn't know what the, who the woman was, and he just sees his, his, his future daughter-in-law or the promised daughter-in-law pregnant, and it's not one of his boys, and his anger is kindled. And he says, burn her. But Tamar has something up her sleeve. She's kept three things that Judah gave to her on that faithful night. Look at verse 25. It was while she was being brought out that she sent word to her father-in-law saying, I am pregnant by the man to whom these things belong. She also said, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. Now, if this were to happen today, there'd be 100 people holding cell phones recording the, the happenings, right? And, and you'd hear people going, oh, you know, you'd hear all the, the, the crowd screaming, You'd see TikToks and, and YouTube videos showing how, how Tamar owned Judah. But think back to the ancient world. What was probably happening is, is that people mourned, people wailed, people covered their mouths. People couldn't stand to look at what was happening because they could piece things together. Judah was ashamed. And he says, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila. And he did not have relations with her again. What do we make of what Tamar did? Because her husband died and two husbands died. There was one that was next in line. She needed a son 
to be produced to provide an heir so she could not only just keep the line flowing, but so that she could be protected in her old age. Was she wrong in what she did? Again, from a, from a, a non-Christian perspective, absolutely not. She did exactly what she had to do, and she got what she wanted, what was promised to her. She got what she deserved. And this is where a lot of people would say, that the ends justify the means. It doesn't matter how she got there. As long as she got what was hers, everything is good. From a Christian perspective, we don't function that way. And we don't see her actions being praised by God either here. She was a fornicator and she was dishonest. Two things that have kind of been present with every character in Genesis, it seems like. And God doesn't say she was righteous. It was Judah that says she was righteous. Now, I've got conflicting feelings about this. I'm just going to be honest with you. On one hand, I'm really, really glad to see that Judah was humbled. He's kind of a slime ball. He's a liar. He mistreated his daughter-in-law. He wanted her to be burned. It's kind of bad. He's not a good guy. He made her life difficult. And if it were up to him, he would see Tamar live out the rest of her life with no children. But on the other hand, I don't believe the ends justify the means. I think the outcome matters, but how we get there matters just as much. If we end up doing good deeds but step over people to get there, all those good deeds are not worth anything. It's tainted. Now, I think this passage is one that gives people fits for this reason. They, they see someone being praised, again, not by God here, but they see someone being praised when they did something dishonest. What do we do with this? Well, I think two things. First, that God can and does accomplish this. He does accomplish his purposes through sinful people. Again, we're seeing this over and over in Genesis. We've seen this through our own lives, is that God can take tainted people, people who are uh, uh, wicked by all definition, enemies of God, and he can mold them, mold us into creatures that serve his purpose. He can take people who are enemies and make them family. We've seen this over and over We've also seen that God cares for the mistreated. We've seen this again with with Hagar, with Abraham, and and we've, we've seen how God cared for her. And we see that even though Tamar does something that's not okay, that God still provides for her. She was abused. She was mistreated. She was the victim in this. And she did bad things, but God still saw how she had been victimized and gave her what she desperately wanted. And in fact, God gave her two. She had twin boys. When the first son was about to be born, he, uh, his hand came out and uh, first and the midwife tied a scarlet thread to identify him as firstborn, but he withdrew his hand and the other brother was actually born first. The, the first boy to be born was named Perez, which means breach or breakthrough. The other son with the scarlet thread on his hand was named Zerah, which means rising. Now you may think back to the other set of twins that are listed in Scripture. There's only two, as far as I can tell, Jacob and Esau. And in both stories, the younger son achieves a more prominent role over the older son, which goes against the customs of the day, showing that God used uh, uh, things that the culture would have rejected The firstborn was always the most important, and God said, no, no, I'm going to flip this around. I'm going to use the weak instead of the strong. I'm going to use the second instead of the first. Now, there's more to this story, and and there's more in terms of what it leads to. The book of Ruth closes with the genealogical record from Perez to David, and Matthew's gospel uses this record to show how it leads to Christ. This is not some insignificant story about people with messed up lives. And this leads me to my conclusion this morning. And I, don't, uh, I didn't think about this until I read a sermon from a, a, another pastor to help me understand and appreciate this. 
In Matthew 1, the genealogy of Christ, Tamar is the first woman listed. Do you know who else you see in there? Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Now, what do you think, why don't you think that these women like Sarah and Rebecca and Leah and Rachel are listed? All four of the women listed before Mary were Gentiles. They were not part of the covenant. They were Gentiles. And what do you think God wants us to see here? That there is hope for the Gentiles. That Jesus did not come just to save the Jews. That the promised Messiah didn't belong just to the Israelites. That the promised Messiah belonged to the world. All of those outside of the covenant family. When Jesus was brought to the temple by his parents, Simeon picked them up and said this, quote, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Matthew's gospel begins with the genealogy of Christ, Gentiles included. And it ends with the Great Commission, where Jesus says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Pull yourself out of modern-day Western thought. Put yourself in some spot around the Mediterranean a few thousand years ago. You're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, and you come across the book of Genesis and you read this. And then you hear stories about this Jesus. And you hear the stories that have been passed down about his genealogy, about the family history that he has. And you start to hear names and you're reading in Genesis and you say, well, okay, not an Israelite, not an Israelite, not an Israelite, not an Israelite. Not only that, these four women, some of them have some interesting stories. And you're someone outside of the family and you see, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus, this Messiah, this this person that everyone was waiting for has come and it's not just to those people that he's come for. He's come for me. He's not just come to save the Jews. He's come to save everyone. He's come to save everyone who would put put their faith and trust in Christ. Jew, Gentile, everyone. This is John 3.16. We see, for God so loved the world. When Jews would hear that, they would think that's offensive because God loved us. He didn't love the world, no. God loved the world outside of Judaism that he would send his son to substitute for them. I wonder why this is included in scripture. It's included in scripture because it points us directly to Christ, that Christ has come to save Jew and Gentile. The story of the gospel moves in spite of everything uh, that we do to slow it down. And here in Genesis chapter 38... And in the Gospels, they're connected. God gives us hope that anyone can be used for his glory. Would you pray with me? 